Good morning. Welcome to our Lord's house in this fourth Sunday after Pentecost. We are here because Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. As we're gathered here, I would invite you to fill out the attendance pads that are at the ends of the pews and record your attendance in God's house in this morning. And uh, if you're a, a guest, uh, please uh, do leave your contact information as well. And members, if you have anything to update in there also, please note that. And if you're interested in joining the congregation, please uh, note that also. In uh, a few weeks, Sunday, July 9th, in the evening, we're going to have a progressive dinner between some of our local congregations. We'll uh, have an opportunity to mix and mingle with our fellow Christians between St. Mary, Grace, and Trinity, and St. Paul, and uh, to get to know another. And, and a lot of times we gather at weddings or funerals in, in these local churches, but don't always have the opportunity to get to know one another as well. And so um, the priests and pastors, and, and I've uh, been about this, and uh, we're going to start this, see how it goes. And St. Paul is responsible for salads, and so if you're going to be able to come, please do bring a salad. And if you would like to provide a salad and, but can't come, you can still do that also. There's a sign-up sheet on the back table for providing salads for that. It'll be 5 o'clock at St. Mary with appetizers, 5.30 here at St. Paul for salads, 6 o'clock at Grace for burgers and hot dogs, and 6.30 at Trinity for desserts. And, you know, it won't be hard and fast on that half hour, so if you, can't, uh, if you can't come to one of the earlier times still, you can come to one of the later times and uh, just join in that rotation also. So uh, put that on your calendar if you can and, and look forward to just another post-July 4th celebration here in West Point. The registration is open for the annual golf tournament as a fundraiser for scholarships and, and for such and for congregational events. And that will be Sunday, August 20th. And you can contact Monty Hazy or Tara Repper to register for that golf tournament. <coughs> Craig Sturts with our Nebraska district uh, will be providing a financial planning workshop on September 10th as you make uh, financial plans for your estate and for the future and, and how to do charitable giving with that. That will be Sunday, September 10th during Bible study time and then with the lunch to follow. And so you are encouraged highly to attend that. And if you've uh, already gotten your estate plans all done, that's awesome. Um, if you have not done it yet, I would highly, highly encourage you to come. My wife and myself have been putting that on hold for years and years, saying we need to get it done, we need to get it done. Well, we are in the process of right now. We're just a few steps away from that. And, and so again, it's easy to put off, but it is something that should not be put off because you do have a will in one way or the other. If you haven't crafted it, the state has. And you won't have a say about that if you don't get that uh, done ahead of time. So again, uh, September uh, 10th, and would encourage you to, to consider that and learn more about how you can provide for uh, others in the future as well as make the, the best of your estate planning. Red letter challenge materials are still available. Just contact the church office. Women's Bible study on Thursday evenings will be a new study beginning this Thursday, June 29th at 6 to 8 p.m. in the church basement. The theme is Colossians Rooted in Him by Daily Grace Company and all women of the community are, are welcome to attend. And currently, the church office has varying hours, so please do call ahead before coming to the office if you need to do so throughout the week. And now let's stand, let's greet one another as the people of Christ, and let us worship. And in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day, this little Easter, 
And as we gather to worship you, we also prepare our hearts to not only hear your word, but also to put it into action today and the rest of this week, the rest of our lives until you return. Lord, as we hear about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that furnace of fire and what you did in your mighty power and as they trusted you to take care of them, Lord, we place that same trust in you. Even though the circumstances may be different, we know that you are with us no matter what the circumstances are. And so, Lord, as we worship you today, we give you our hearts, we give you our lives, and now as we focus our thoughts on you, we ask your Spirit to guide us with even more insight than we've had in the past, not just for our sake, but for us to also go and tell others how good you are. In your name, Jesus Christ, we pray this. Amen. We continue with our opening hymn, How Firm a Foundation, hymn 728. We begin as we were baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We come before our Lord in confession, even as Jesus invites us to come to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Gracious Lord, we confess we have not always sought rest for ourselves, nor our burdened souls in you. Instead, seeking refuge in the temporary things of this world, forgive us. Jesus says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Lord, we confess we have not come nor followed as you desire, nor denied ourselves. Instead, at times, denying the cross and faith you have graciously given, forgive us. In a parable, Jesus says, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 
Lord, we confess we have not always been mindful of your eternal kingdom, instead focusing on the things of this world. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us. Jesus speaks of the day when the Son of Man comes. Until that day, as we come before him in our sin and our shame and with our struggles in this world, he comes to us out of unconditional love with mercy and grace. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Lord Jesus. We join in our entrance psalm. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling. And I may walk before God in the life. When I am afraid, I trust in, you. in God whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. In God whose word I praise. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, our refuge and our strength and ever present hope in times of need, grant your abiding presence as we walk through this way world, that as you come to us still today, we walk in you until the last day when the Son of Man comes and makes all things new. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. We hear the word of the Lord. The Old Testament lesson for today is from Psalm 91, beginning with verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks, stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you, no disaster will come near your tent. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading for today is from Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 12. <clears throat> Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves. 
just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand now in honor of our Lord Jesus. We hear the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? So do not be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Having heard God's word together, now we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I invite the children to come forward for a children's message. Good morning, good morning. How are you all this morning? Good. Good morning. Welcome up front. Do you remember saying just a few minutes ago, in God I trust? We said that repeated it and when we repeat stuff it's so it helps us remember it right yeah in God I trust can you say that with me in God I trust and I have a special coin and a little bit of a story here with this coin you can pass this around let's start over here can you pass that around what does it look like? A giant penny? 
It's a two-penny piece. And it's older than Mr. Bill. <laughs> Let me tell you a story about this coin. America was in the midst of the Civil War when the Reverend N.R. Watkinson wrote a letter in 1861, the subject of which is still being debated. But the Pennsylvania pastor wrote to Treasury Secretary Salmon P. Chase urging him to honor God on the nation's coinage to place us openly under the divine protection that we have personally proclaimed. Pass it on down here. In 1864, and when did West Point become a little city? Was it before or after 1864? It was around that time. Congress passed and President Lincoln signed the Mint Act and made the two-cent piece become the first coin bearing the motto, In God We Trust. So that coin is about as old or older than West Point. And you can still spend it today, but I'm not gonna. Because this says, right in the top there, in God, and the we is kind of worn off from use, but in God we trust. One of the first coins that had that on the coin itself. And you know what this coin is, don't you? It's a quarter. Does it say, in God we trust on it, Wyatt? Yes, it does. All American coins and bills say that on it. In God we trust, right there. And that's a good reminder for us whenever we spend money that we trust God, not the money, right? But we trust God. And we're going to hear about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They weren't spending money, but they got in trouble with the king because they said, it's in God we trust. We're not going to worship your statue that you built. And they almost became crispy critters. Yeah, you knew that? I've heard that before? That is good. And so we're going to learn more about that this morning. But when you go to the store and you spend some money on something and you can remind the person that's at the cashier register that you trust in God too, just like it says on the money. And you hope they do also. And then maybe you can have a little bit of a chat with them about Jesus. Think you could do that? And remind them, in God we trust because Jesus is trustworthy and he saved us and we'll be with him forever and ever and ever and so now you can say that you have held one of the first coins that said in God we trust on it and every coin you hold from now on when you even if you put it in the offering plate as an offering back to God you're saying God I trust you to take care of me I give my first and best and, take, and trust you to take care of the rest. Can you say that with me? God, I trust you to take care of me. I give you the best and trust you to take care of the rest. In God we trust. So who's ready to tell the cashiers, in God we trust? Yeah, in Jesus we trust. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you that we can trust you for forgiveness, for taking care of us every day, and for coming back someday to take us to your home in heaven. Help us tell others that we trust in you, and we hope they do too. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And here's some fruit snacks, M&Ms. You can take your pick. And thank you for coming up. And remember, in God we trust. There you go. All righty. Thanks for coming up. You can go back to your families. 
As we join in singing our next hymn, it's something that uh, you maybe didn't know. If we could go to the next slide. All you works of God, bless the Lord. It's in the hymnal 930. While it's not from the Bible straight itself, traditionally it is a song that was sung by the men in the fiery furnace. And uh, while it's not in the Bible, it is written in the Apocrypha, some of those books that are in the middle of some Bibles. And we recognize its good Jewish historical value. And, and so even though it's not in the Bible itself, it does echo some of the Psalms. And so what were those men doing in the fiery furnace? They were also talking back to God while they trusted in him. So as we join in singing this, uh, maybe you've, you've heard it before, or maybe seen it, the song of the, the three young men, but that's where it comes from, and we get to join the three men as they sang the praises to God.
God's mercy, grace, and peace are yours. In Jesus Christ, our Lord who lives, amen. Will you please join me in prayer? Dear gracious God and Father, as we hear again this story, this account of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, many years ago where you preserved their lives because they trusted in you. And also we see how their trust impacted the lives of so many others as they witnessed your mighty power. And Lord, as we witness your mighty power today, it may not necessarily be with the flames of a fiery furnace, but you are present with us always. So continue to open our eyes as we open our mouths and confess you as our Lord and Savior. Open our eyes that we may see where you are working. Those miracles, even the things that are in the daily mundane parts of life, you're still present. And you're taking every single opportunity to bring your name and your deeds of salvation through the cross and the empty tomb and everything else that you have done to the hearts and the lives of not only us, but also all people on this earth. And so I pray, Lord Jesus, as you grow us in faith, as you strengthen our faith, so that we can stand even in the midst of persecution. Lord, we ask that you not only bless us, but you bless our witness, our proclamation that you are the Most High God. And so I pray, Lord Jesus, may the words that I speak and the thoughts that go on inside all of our hearts and minds May they truly be pleasing, perfect, and holy in your sight. For you are that foundational rock upon whom we stand, and we stand because you stand as our Redeemer who is with us because you are risen. Amen. Fired up, but not burnt out. How many of you have ever felt you were burned out? worn out, weary. This is different. And while, yes, we may get weary of the world, wearied during a day, we get tired. That's why the Lord also built in rest for his people. Just as we are doing now, this first day of the week, giving God the first and the best and trusting him to take care of the rest. And there's days we get burned out, worn out. There's also days we get fired up about something. Well, the Lord wants us to be fired up for him, but the good news is he will never burn us out. And as you look at that picture on that slide, you see the men in the fiery furnace, the young men. Remember, these young men carted off by King Nebuchadnezzar out of exile from Jerusalem. Teenagers early 20s perhaps, dancing in the flames. Not because those flames are hot and they're trying to move around, but because they're not being burned and they're praising the Lord. And they are fired up for the Lord. And the Lord wants us to be fired up for him too in any and every situation. And as we consider this account of Daniel Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and what they went through. We could also call it a tale of two statues. Remember last week was King Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the statue, head of gold, chest and arms of silver, bronze waist, iron legs, iron and clay feet. King Nebuchadnezzar had this dream and he didn't know what it was about but he knew that it was up to something about him as a king. And he told all of his magicians and wise men and astrologers, you need to tell me what I dreamed and then interpret it so that I know that you're going to tell me the truth. They responded, there's no one among men that can do that. Although Daniel replied, will you please give me time, as he spoke with wisdom and tact, asking for more time respectfully, and then prayed to the God of heaven 
that he would spare him and all of his friends, and even the others that were not yet believers in him. And God granted Daniel that vision, seeing that statue, and then the ability to interpret it and tell Nebuchadnezzar, you're at the top right now. You're that kingdom of that head of gold. Other kingdoms will follow you. Your kingdom will not stand forever. But then that statue will crumble apart as it is smashed down by a rock that comes from the side. And that rock grows and fills the entire world, being the kingdom of God. Well, Nebuchadnezzar went on with life, and then he built another statue, saying, I'm the king. As long as I've got a kingdom, I'm the king. Well, why else and what else was going on in Nebuchadnezzar's life? When we are able to look into the histories that have been written in Babylon, other things have been uncovered. And here's a possible historical setting. We're not exactly sure if this is the exact same timepiece, the same years, but there were some things going on in Babylon and in King Nebuchadnezzar's entire empire. There was a revolt against King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, and he put it down in 595 the end of that year B.C., the first part of 594. And when you put a a revolution down, he showed his strength. Y'all lost. I'm still king. And we can see Nebuchadnezzar's pride doing something about that. He required the loyalty and the obedience of all officials throughout his empire. And he built this statue that as we hear in the beginning of Daniel chapter 3, and I'd invite you to pull out your smart app of, of your Bible on your phone, or in your Bible if you brought it, or when you're back at home, dig into Daniel chapter 3. It says that King Nebuchadnezzar gave this order that Whenever you heard all these different instruments being played, you were to bow down to the statue that he had set up, all of the officials and all of the leaders. And in the prophet Jeremiah's book, chapter 51 indicates that even King Zedekiah took a trip to Babylon. Doesn't say what about, but at that same time and period, after that revolt, Very possibly, King Zedekiah, who was one of the faithless kings of Judah, who should have been the leader of the faith for the people, was there and bowed down to this idol. And yet, as we continue to hear, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not. And we might wonder, well, what about Daniel? He's not even mentioned in this chapter. What the historians figure is that this was the order for all the all the outside provinces and areas around. Daniel served in the palace itself. Nebuchadnezzar would have had their utmost loyalty. And so it wasn't necessarily required of Daniel. But when all these others were out there in the area, they were seeing a mighty tall statue. And just for comparison's sake, this statue of gold, 90 feet tall roughly, they said it was measured in cubits, well, forearm to the tip, however long that is for a different person, but roughly 90 feet tall. And in comparison, the Statue of Liberty from the base to the top is 151 feet. The sower is only 19 feet at the top of our capital but on top of a 400-foot structure. It can be seen for 20 miles away on a good day, they say. And you've probably seen it. Well, here's a 90-foot tall statue right outside the city of Babylon. And when you hear all of these different instruments, the zither, the harp, the drums, the whatever, the whatever, start bowing down and acknowledge Nebuchadnezzar as your king and like a god. It's a pretty big eye, isn't it? Nebuchadnezzar had quite an ego. I am king. I even had a dream about it, and I'm the head of gold at the top. 
Well, what is the middle letter of the word sin? It's a big I, isn't it? Sin is ourselves curved in on ourselves, wrapped up in ourselves. I'm the most important, and I'm going to do what I want, even though, God, you may have told me otherwise. Rather than, I want to do what you want, O God. So what had Nebuchadnezzar done? Look at all these eyes. The image of gold, an idol, to be worshipped. God had said, don't do that. And that was even written on Nebuchadnezzar's heart, as it is on everybody. Instruments, when you hear them, all sorts of them, start bowing down. No, nothing wrong with the instruments. But Nebuchadnezzar was using them to direct them to worship this image, this idol. The instructions bow down when you hear it. All of you officials, all of you leaders, show me your, that you're loyal to me. You won't rise up in insurrection and revolution. And all the individuals obeyed, it says, except for three. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were over the provinces in Babylon. And so all the others that were forced to bow down, what did they do? They became informers to the king. They started tattling. King Nebuchadnezzar, didn't you say that everyone was to bow down to this image when they heard all of these instruments start playing? Well, yes, I did. Well, these three guys didn't. And they're of that Jewish race. You know those odd ones that say there's only one God? Well, the king became irate. And as we see in a little bit, he increased the heat in the furnace seven times, he said, hotter than normal. You might say perfectly hot. Nebuchadnezzar thinking, I'm going to throw everything that my gods have at you guys. There's no hope for you. You're going to be burnt up. And yet, those three were inside the fire and they survived. So let's dig a little deeper. Let's hear about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's response of wisdom and tact when they were called by King Nebuchadnezzar. Weren't you supposed to bow down? And here's their response of wisdom and tact. Respectful. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. He will rescue us. That is trust. That is faith. Standing up rather than bowing down to this false god, this false idol image, even though they respect the king and are under him, observing the fourth commandment, they're saying, we must obey God rather than men, as the apostle said later after Jesus was crucified and risen, and they proclaimed him as the risen one. We can't bow down to your statue, because the God we serve is able to save us from your blazing furnace of fire. He will rescue us from your hand, O oh, king, he's mightier than you. And perhaps and probably Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were recalling these words that God spoke through the prophet Isaiah before they had been carted off in exile. God speaking to his people, many who had forgotten him, were not worshiping him, but giving his people still hope. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Remember the Red Sea? How I brought your ancestors through out of Egypt, out of slavery? Parted the Red Sea waters and you went through on dry ground and then those waters collapsed on Pharaoh and his army? When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Remember how I parted the Jordan River? And your ancestors walked through on dry ground into the Promised Land? And it was at flood stage at the time too. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. 
When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego hadn't experienced that before, nor had their ancestors, specifically speaking. Although they saw the fire on top of Mount Sinai when God gave his law to Moses, But now, their faith was being put to the test, and they were passing with flying colors. They were trusting, O King, our God can deliver us. He's promised, the flames will not set you ablaze. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And so this is what they then say. He can save us. He will rescue us from your hand, O King. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O King, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Our God can do it. But we're not going to put the Lord our God to the test. We're not going to say you must do this. We just want you to know Nebuchadnezzar, he can. And even if he doesn't, we're going to be with him. He will rescue us from your hand. We're your captives right now. We just want you to know Nebuchadnezzar, O king. We worship the true God the Most High God, the God of Israel. Even if he does not, we want you to know, O King, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. We're not putting our God to the test. But in our God, we're putting our trust. We're not putting the Lord our God to the test. But we're putting our trust in the Lord our God. He can save us. We're not scared of you. We love you. But we're not scared of you in this penalty. Well, this had been an orderly conversation with their wisdom, with their tact, but then Nebuchadnezzar got fired up himself. He was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude toward them changed. You're dissing me. You're not doing what I said, and I'm the king. And he ordered that furnace to be heated seven times hotter than normal. Again, just throw everything we got into it, burn it hotter, burn it higher. And then he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. We don't want you to wiggle out while we're tossing you in. We want you to stay wrapped up and tied up good and strong with the strongest soldiers that were going to listen to the king then. So these men... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes. You can almost hear Daniel writing this down now. Just as before, when you hear the sound of the zither, the lyre, the harp, the blah, 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 of all the instruments, all you leaders bow down. Well, they were tossed into that fiery furnace, but they still didn't bow before Nebuchadnezzar or his idol. Wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Killed the soldiers that got near the heat. They weren't even in the flames and they died. But yet, what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? start walking around talking to the Lord because the Lord was right there with them 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? Look, I see four men walking around in the fire. Am I seeing things straight? And that fourth one looks like a son of the gods. My soldiers died just from the heat. And these three guys are joined by a fourth, and he looks like a son of the gods. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had never really even seen a true god. Oh, he had images, he had idols. But right there, the Lord showed up. I am with you. The flames will not consume you. And God protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They did not put their God to the test, but they put their trust in their God. And their God and our God delivered them. And Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace, and he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, having to shout over the roar of the flames. Servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. And they did. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. This is a sight no one had ever seen. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. When was the last time you stood by the barbecue? You smelled like smoke afterwards, didn't you? And it smelled good, didn't it? Some of you have probably smelled a house fire. That doesn't smell so good. Filled with destruction. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not singed, were not burned. Their clothes were fully in. The soldiers who had tossed him in were dead. But they were alive, walking, talking, praising the Lord. And they had been walking with the Lord, who was right there with them. A sight to be seen. So what else was there to say? Led by King Nebuchadnezzar, who had a change of heart, and his mind was changed about what he told the others to do. He said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. They were fired up for their god, weren't they? We're not going to bow down to any other god and we're going to proclaim him as the only god. He can save us from this. We'll just leave it up to him if he saves us right here or if he saves us eternally. God, you can do it. We'll leave it up to you how to do it. Willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. And Nebuchadnezzar continues, Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. What a turnabout. You need to bow down and praise me. Do I take that back? And no one else should be worshiping anything or talking against their God. Look to him. He saved them out of certain death. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Made them even higher than they were before. So what about us? You fired up? Just remember, 
when you're persecuted and we are persecuted on this side of heaven. Some more so than others right now. But remember those words of Jesus. You're not above the master. Don't be surprised when people try to take out their hatred for Jesus upon you. When you go from the frying pan into the fire for your faith, you are on fire for the Lord figuratively and spiritually speaking. But just remember, Jesus and his Holy Spirit are with you always, even to the end of the age. So when people call you to account for your faith, remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, perhaps dancing around the fire because they were alive, they were fired up for their Lord, but not consumed by the flames of earthly fire. And remember this, you will not be consumed by the fire of hell because you trust in Jesus who walks with you, who is with you, who holds on to you. And so we don't put our, the Lord our God to the test but in him we put our trust. In God we trust. So how else can we show people that we're fired up for Jesus? You ever had someone ask you for a light? Pardon me, do you have a light? Not just for a cigarette these days. Do you have a flashlight? Do you have a light to show me something in this darkness that I'm experiencing right now? literally and figuratively. And even one little light scatters the darkness. And as you and I share the light of Jesus Christ as well as a lighter or a flashlight or a candle with someone, we share with them Jesus is the light of your world. He wants to light up your life. And if you feel that you're being burnt up, remember this, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. God also said that through the prophet Isaiah. He renews your strength and lifts you up as on eagle's wings. As we put our trust in him while the world puts us to the test. And that image with the ablaze cross, something that our synod had used years ago, is a reminder to be on fire for the Lord, to share the faith. And so the question is asked, whom will you share your light with today? Because you're fired up for Jesus, knowing that he stands with you in the midst of whatever flames this world puts you in as it turns up the heat. It's not hot in the furnace when you're with the Lord. He sees us through whatever the trial, whatever the test. So the next time someone says, pardon me, do you have a light? You can say, absolutely. But more than just this simple light, I share with you Jesus, the light of the world who is with you, and he's shown it before, he'll show it again. In the name of Jesus, share the light of the world. Amen. And that peace of Jesus Christ that goes beyond all human understanding will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord who lives. Amen. We continue our worship now as we return our tithes and offerings, saying, God, we give you our best, and we trust you to take care of the rest. We also join in singing our next hymn, Have No Fear, Little Flock.
As the offerings are brought forward, I would ask the officers and board members to come forward for the installation. Leaders, these are your leaders whom you have elected at our previous voters meeting as we begin this new term of service beginning July 1st. Beloved in the Lord, Holy Scripture admonishes us that all things should be done decently and in order. To that end, the Constitution and bylaws of this congregation establish various offices to which men and women are elected and appointed to serve. In so doing, the church follows the example of the early Christian church as described in Acts chapter 6. The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. We devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The Apostle Peter writes in his first epistle, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another, as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. All of these servant leaders have been elected to serve in various boards and officer positions. You've been chosen to fill specific offices and positions of responsibility at St. Paul Lutheran Church. You are to work with myself, the pastor, that our life together in Christ may be orderly and pleasing in his sight. You are to see that the services of God's house are held at proper times, that the word of God is purely preached and taught according to the Lutheran confessions, that the sacraments of Christ are administered according to his institution, that provision is made for the Christian instruction of young and old, that the erring are admonished and that discipline is maintained. You are to see that the temporal affairs of the congregation are properly administered and that proper support is provided for the workers of this congregation. You are to assist in caring for the poor and the sick, in cultivating harmony among the members, in promoting the general welfare of the congregation, and in furthering the kingdom of Christ here and throughout the world. While holiness of life and obedience to Christ are expected of all members of the congregation, it's especially important that you as office bearers in his church Show yourselves by word and example to be faithful to him in service and Christian devotion. In the presence of God and of this congregation, I therefore ask you, do you accept the offices entrusted to you? And do you promise faithfully to carry out your duties, trusting in the Lord and conforming yourself to his word in accordance with the faith of the Evangelical Lutheran Church? If so, then answer, I do. Dear members of the congregation, beloved in the Lord, you have heard the promises of faithfulness spoken by these men and women whom you have selected to serve as officers. Do you promise to support them in their work, to remember them in your prayers, and to work with them to the best of the abilities that God has given you, so that he may be glorified and his work be done in our midst? If so, then answer, we do. We do. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I install you as officers of St. Paul Lutheran Church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the Almighty and most merciful God, enlighten, strengthen you in your offices, that you may be good and faithful stewards to the glory of his name and the good of his people. Amen. Let us all stand for prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you've raised up these servants for work among your people. We humbly ask you to grant them by your Holy Spirit those gifts needed for the faithful carrying out of their tasks, most especially wisdom, strength, and willing hearts. Let your blessing rest on this congregation. Strengthen the faith, quicken the love, and enkindle the zeal of its members, that your name may be glorified, and that here and in all places under heaven, the kingdom of your Son may be advanced. We remember with thanksgiving those who have faithfully served your people. 
and have now completed their time of service. We pray that in the end of days, we with all your faithful people may hear the voice of Christ saying, come you who are blessed by my, by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So go in the name of the Lord, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. You may return to your seats and we join in the prayer of the church. We pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord our God, you are our refuge and fortress in whom we make our dwelling place. Strengthen our faith in your word as done through Jeremiah, the Apostle Paul, and our Savior Jesus Christ. Help us to dispel our doubts and unbelief that we be your witnesses of truth, life, and light. In your mercy, hear our prayer. When we face the many trials and temptations living as your people, give us strength to show your mercy and forgiveness. With so many things fleeting and temporary, help us hold to what lasts, which is your word, your promises, and life with you. In your mercy, hear our prayer. As we remain in this world, you have given us authorities for our good. Enable us to keep your commands to honor our fathers and mothers and to be faithful citizens to authorities placed over us in our nation, state, and communities. Grant your wisdom, truth, compassion, and care upon all those who lead, that in this world we and others may in confidence and joy await your kingdom to come when the Son of God comes. In your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who are weighed down by sin and shame, Point them to the life-giving and forgiving cross of Christ. For those who are weighed down by ailments in this life, spiritually, emotionally, or physically, especially we pray for Kristen, Courtney, Reagan, Bill Berry, Kenny Krupka, Doreen Meyer, Marge Elsasser, May Lund, Don Sharman, Nancy Rose, Alan Legband, Bob Klitz, Sandy Krupka, Gina Metzke, Eva Wickert, Tara Reppert, Carol Schultz-Stevens, Tony Romschek, Laverna Lambrecht, Tammy Kramer, Elaine Trainer, Julia Kramer, Susanna Whaling, and Jean Engelbart. Grant your presence of comfort and peace in times of need. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Heavenly Father, we also give you thanks for the celebration of Eva Wickert's 95th birthday yesterday. We thank you for the blessings you have showered upon her in these past years and look forward to the same in the days that come. Lord, we also ask your blessings upon our school and our upcoming school year. Bless the teachers and staff and lead us, Lord, as we proclaim your name to the children that they might proclaim it to the world. We also pray for all who serve and protect as police, fire, EMTs, first responders, healthcare workers, military personnel, and all their families. Watch over them as they watch over us. And we also pray for those who have gone on our behalf to form lands with your word, in particular, Jana Inglehart and Josh Lang and family and Ruth Maita and family. Lord, your word will not return to you empty. Continue to provide them the support and the encouragement that they need. And as they share your word, that hearts would be open to hearing and then doing your word also, joining us in the work of witness. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And we pray as Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus said, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus with you all. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We join in closing by singing on eagle's wings as our Lord lifts us up to have a soar throughout this week, hymn 727. Go in peace as you serve the Lord.